All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for thanks for being here. Um, my name is Tor Mitchell. Uh, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about product management today. Um, just uh, for my own benefit, how many people here are familiar with, or at least have heard of, the role of a product manager? Okay, that's good. It's a lot more than normal. Um, how many people feel like they understand what that role is and what it involves? Okay, good. So it's not a complete waste of time being here, that's good. To know. Okay, so before we begin, a little bit about me. Um, so I uh, originally studied physics a long time ago, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, and, but was always dabbling in technology, was always messing about with computers. And so when I graduated, I got a, a job with a company called Sun Microsystems, who were a big um, hardware and internet services company, networking services company, back in the late 90s. They did very, very well out of the dot-com explosion of the late 90s, and they did very, very badly out of the dot-com implosion of the early 2000s. And I was there throughout that ride, mostly in support and uh, what we call sustaining engineering roles. So that's development, but it's that sort of halfway house between support and a new product development where you're managing um, existing products, fixing bugs, patches, service packs, that sort of thing. Uh, and then um, I spent about half of that time in the UK, and I spent about half of it at their headquarters in Santa Clara in, uh, in California. And then after that, I uh, came back to the UK and joined Google. Again, still more on, in, uh, on, technical, on the technical side. Started in London, uh, a couple of years in London, then moved to Sydney in Australia. And it's really while I was in Sydney, I was there for about five years, that I moved into product management. Uh, and then uh, eventually moved with them to San Francisco, spent a few years working for them uh, in Silicon Valley. And then after nine years at Google, last year moved back to the UK, joined a startup which is somewhat unusually based down in Exeter, in Devon, called Crowdcube, who are uh, the UK's largest equity crowdfunding platform. So we essentially help companies raise finance as an alternative to the traditional venture capital or angel investor route. Um, it's a bit like Kickstarter, except you actually become a shareholder rather than just getting a product. So at Crowdcube, I lead the product team. I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about what that means in a moment. So why am I here? One of the first things I was asked to do when I joined Crowdcube was build a team of product managers. And having worked with a mixture of experienced product managers and entry-level product managers at Google, uh, I was keen to uh, have a similar mix in my team. So I posted two jobs, one for an experienced PM and one for what we call an associate PM, which is a graduate-level role. Uh, my expectation was that it would be hard to find experienced PMs because product management isn't that well established as a discipline in the UK. Um, but at least with the associate role, I had essentially a, the whole of the graduate population uh, to, to, um, to pick from, and I was completely wrong. It turned out to be not too difficult to fill the, the experienced roles because Crowdcube has fairly good brand recognition here in London where most of the PMs are, but extremely hard to fill the graduate role. And the main reason for this was because there was almost no awareness within the graduate community of what product management is, why you might want to do it. And so there was nobody looking for this role. And if someone saw this role, they wouldn't identify it as one that might be interesting to them. We did eventually manage to fill, it, fill this position. Um, we got lucky, essentially. There was someone fairly local um, who uh, was, was interested. But uh, this worried me greatly because the UK startup ecosystem has really flourished in the last few years. Uh, and as it grows and continues to grow, it will have a continuing need for product managers. But there's just no pipeline in this country. So I figured I should, rather than just complain about this, try and do something about it. Um, so this presentation, essentially, um, which I put together, not just for, for today, but I've been delivering at a number of different institutions over the last few months, and hope to continue doing so, is really just about raising the awareness of product management amongst people like yourself as a, as a career path. It's not a recruiting exercise. I'm not hiring at the moment. Um, it's purely about trying to get people to recognize the role and consider it, or rule it out um, as, a product man as, a, as, a, as a career choice. Even if you decide it's not for you, if you end up working in technology, you will inevitably come across people like me. It would be good for you to understand what you're up against. OK, this is the basic structure of, of what we're going to talk about today. Firstly, an outline of the role, just uh, explaining what we do. Then a little bit of information to try and help you understand whether this might be interesting to you. Both, um, is it something that you would enjoy? And also, is it something that you're well suited to? Lastly, assuming you are interested, how would you actually go about getting started in the role? 
Okay, so firstly, what is a product manager? Now I should preface this with a caveat, which is that I'm going to be talking about product management almost exclusively from the perspective of technology companies. That's what I'm familiar with. And certainly if you were to research product management online, you would find the vast majority of information out there relates to the discipline in relation to technology companies. It's really where it, it came out of. It's beginning to expand now into other disciplines. You start to see product management roles in um, hardware companies and physical product companies. It's a little bit different. I don't have much experience of that. So sometimes you'll see this referred to as digital product management amongst the recruiting population. So start with the obvious. We talk about product managers, we just need to define what a product is. Um, a product, I'm talking about any hardware, software, or service that might be offered to consumers or businesses. Anything that falls into that category, be it an app on your phone, be it a smart thermostat, be it some accounting software, um, may well have a product manager or benefit from having a product manager associated with it. Okay, so if we were going to sum up the role of a product manager in a single phrase, this is how I'd do it. The role of the product manager is to own the success of the product. So, for any given product, there is a product manager and their job is to do whatever it takes to make sure that product is as successful as it can be, by whatever definition of success applies to that product. And part of the role is figuring that out. First, that's a nice uh, snappy line, but what does that actually mean in reality? Well. The analogy I like to, to use is that of the conductor of an orchestra. So the conductor of an orchestra decides what the orchestra will play and then coordinates all the musicians to deliver the best possible experience for the audience. And a product manager is similar in a lot of ways. They decide what the, the engineering team or the product team will build, what they will deliver, and then they coordinate everybody involved to try and deliver the best possible experience for the user. They don't actually build anything themselves, just like a conductor doesn't play any instruments themselves. Um, it's really just a facilitating role. So let's break those two parts down. I talked about what will be what will be built, so the planning stage, and then actually getting it built, the delivery stage. And as a product manager, your role is a little different in those two phases in the product lifecycle. So firstly, the planning stage. So in order to figure out what, what needs to be built, you first need to have an understanding of what the goals of, of this product are, or what the goals of the business are. If you're looking at it, looking at it from, uh, from, from the perspective of a startup where there may only be one product, and what is it you're trying to achieve? What is the change you're trying to affect on the world? What are the behaviors you're trying to facilitate? So you have to have a vision for the product, and that's important because ultimately you're going to get, be going out there evangelizing for this vision, motivating people to get involved, to participate, to help you deliver on this vision. Once you've got a vision, then you need a strategy to deliver on that vision. So you need a plan. How are you actually going to get from where you are to where you want to be? That in turn will inform a roadmap, a sequence of releases or milestones that will get you uh, along that path. And each roadmap will have a set of requirements that it tries to meet. Um, normally, we, we describe these as user stories. So um, essentially, a set of user behaviors that you're looking to facilitate in that release. As a product manager, you own essentially the whole of this tree. Right? It's up to you to figure out the vision, it's up to you to figure out the strategy, it's up to you to negotiate the roadmap with your engineering counterparts and then actually document those requirements and make sure that everybody really understands what you're looking to deliver in, in any given release. Okay, so you've done your planning, you have an idea for your, uh, for your product and you have specified exactly um, what will be built. Now we actually get stuck into the delivery phase, so you now you've got a team of designers and software developers and other supporting functions, technical writers, QA and so on, all working together to try and deliver this product that you've spec'd out. So what's your role in that phase of the product? Well, there are lots of pieces to your role. The first thing is you have to manage the schedule. In other words, you've, um, you've committed normally to deliver this product uh, or this release by a certain date or for a certain event. And it's your job to make sure that actually happens. And that will be a combination of uh, coordinating the various resources you have at your disposal to make sure that you've got the right people and enough people working on the project and also managing the scope of the product negotiating what stays in and what may need to drop out uh, because you're running out of time I often get asked what is the difference between a product manager and a project manager it's a common common point of confusion and uh, uh, perhaps a little oversimplified but you could argue that the goal the role of a project manager in organizations that have them is essentially this piece. So sometimes you'll hear these referred to as delivery managers. 
Their job is to make sure that development continues at a pace and on schedule, to clear roadblocks, to understand, um, uh, to resolve dependencies, to keep the leadership team and other stakeholders updated on progress. Um, but they don't have an ownership role over the strategy. Um, and they don't get to make um, user experience decisions, for example. What you tend to find is that startups, you don't have project managers, so that workload falls on the product manager. At larger companies, you may get project managers, which is great because it's one of the least exciting parts of the role. Okay, your next, your next role is your maker of trivial decisions. And what I mean by this is, in the process of developing a product, every day, day in, day out, little decisions come bubbling up from engineering. Exactly how this should this work? No matter how well you have spec a product, you will not have anticipated every corner case, every question, even little things. What should the label be on this button? What color should this be? How should the product behave if a user of this type um, performs the following functions that we hadn't anticipated? Many of these decisions are completely trivial. They're not greatly consequential. They won't make a difference to the success or failure of the product. But someone has to make them, otherwise development just grinds to a halt. And particularly if you have a team of relatively junior developers who don't necessarily feel empowered to make these decisions themselves, they need someone to turn to, and that person is you. Okay, so because you own the success of the product, you're also the person that tends to be most heavily personally invested in the quality of the product. You want this to be something you're proud of, you want this to be something that users enjoy. And so you end up obsessing over that quality. You are essentially involved in a a healthy tug of war with the engineering team who will fight for what is practical and realistic and, and viable in the time available, um, whereas you're pulling for, can we just do a little bit more to make the experience just a little bit better? So you tend to be the first user, the first person who ever touches it, the first person who tests it, um, and you're constantly looking at the product thinking, how do we make this better? How do we improve it? Eventually, this thing has to ship. Nothing you build has any value until it ships. So it has to ship, and that means a launch. Launches vary in size and complexity. If you're working in an agile environment where you're doing a lot of small iterative launches every week, they may be relatively inconsequential or at least not um, greatly troublesome. But inevitably, you will have new products where you have an MVP that you've got to get out the door, and that's a bit of a bigger piece of work. Or you'll have uh, made a deliberate decision, or the business will have made a deliberate decision, to stack up a bunch of releases for some big marketing event. And so you'll have a, a launch to coordinate that might have many different aspects to it. It might involve talking to the marketing team about your messaging, figuring out your go-to-market strategy. You'll be working with the legal team to make sure that you have your privacy and compliance issues under control. You'll be working with your engineering team to make sure that um, security and personal information is well protected. There's so many different things that have to be, you know, T's that have to be crossed and I's that have to be dotted before you can say with confidence, this thing is ready to go. And it's your job as the product manager to make sure that everything is in place. So it's worth stressing, as we've talked through all these different things that you have to do, that you manage a product, you don't manage people. Despite having manager in your name, you have no organizational authority necessarily. Until you know, late in your career when you may be managing other product managers, um, you don't actually have direct authority over the engineers or the marketing team or the legal team or all these other groups that you work with. So, um, your contribution comes through influence, not through authority. You have to build relationships with all these teams. You have to get them to feel comfortable that your, the product is in good hands, that they trust you, that they trust your judgment. Um, and then you have to work with them uh, to ensure that, um, that, as a team, you do what's best for the product. Okay, so that's a basic outline of the role. Make sense, any questions? Yeah? Uh, not sure. I should ask this now or, or, or at the end. So, different companies have different preferences for who they hire. So, Google hire computer science type technically minded uh, students, whereas some other companies are happy to hire someone from a business background who appreciates technology, etc. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on that? What do you think the split is in the sort of UK? No, it's a good question, but yes, we will come to that. Okay. <laughs> Remind me if I forget, but there's a, a, a logical place to talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about why I believe product management is a good career, and let's talk about what it takes to be a good product manager. Okay, 
Um, I'm going to start with a couple of video clips. So uh, what I've been doing recently to um, accompany this presentation has been going around and speaking to successful product managers and just asking them how they got into product management, why they enjoy it, um, and what advice they would have to offer people who are interested in product management. And I'm going to start with this guy, this guy called Marty Kagan, who's very, very well known in the product management community. He runs a, um, a very popular website and group called the Silicon Valley Product Group. Uh, he was originally um, a product manager at Netscape for many years, and then he was a senior product leader at eBay for many years. And now he runs workshops and does consultancy on product management for, um, for a lot of different companies. Um, and I was at one of his workshops recently, and uh, I sat him down and pointed a camera at him and asked him, amongst other things, um, why he believes that product management is a good career. Uh, and this is a, a short excerpt from, uh, from his response. It's an amazing job. And I think there's a very strong argument to say it is the most important non-executive position in a company. It's really second only to the CEO. And that is, um, you can say that about a lot of jobs. And a lot of people have found that this is not only a great job and a great career, but it's a proving ground for eventually starting their own company. In fact, a lot of the best investors out there will only invest in someone who has proven they can be a product manager successfully. So I wasn't sure, I'm never sure whether the sound will work in these presentations, so just in case, I have a slide which has exactly what he said on it, um, but hopefully you caught most of that. Um, I think that's a, it's a, a pretty compelling statement that it's, uh, that it's that significant a position. So Marty, if you like, is at the very experienced end of the spectrum. And I also spoke to some other people, one of which is on the next slide, a guy called Iggy, who works at Judil here in London, um, who are a uh, sort of business analytics company. Um, and he uh, only graduated a couple of years ago, relatively junior. But I asked him why he enjoys product management. So it's really seeing, I mean, if you want to kind of summarize it in one action or whatever, it's, it's seeing the smile on people's faces when you've solved their problem. Um, you know, there's nothing better than, than, than seeing that happen. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, there's a lot of work that goes into building something, um, but during that journey you learn so much about the problem you're solving, who you're solving for, um, and you know, working with a team is one of the best things you can do. It, it is working towards a common goal, but not necessarily it being you know, predefined. It's not not in a sort of agency model. No, someone doesn't say, I want an e-commerce website built. It's, hey, here's a problem, how can we fix it? And in that regard, it's quite a creative role as well as one where um, you, know, you have to hunker down as much as you can. Yeah. All right. So you've probably gotten the impression already, but one of the great things about product management is that you work with an enormous variety of different people. You're in fact quite unusual because you're probably the only person who's exposed to every aspect of the business, um, with the possible exception, I guess, of the CEO. Um, so uh, you're responsible for keeping the leadership updated as to how things are going with your product, but you also have to work with all your stakeholders, some of which will be external customers, some of which may be internal teams. Um, you have to make sure the product is fit to sell, it's, it's, uh, that the support team is ready to support the product. Um, so you get to meet and work with all these people, you get to understand how they think, you get to learn a little bit about everything they do, and that's one of the reasons that it's such a valuable role for building the skills up to run your own company at some point. And once you are in product management, there are a lot of places you can go. It's a very transferable skill, it's a, an in-demand skill, it's also very um, easy to move internationally as well, so it's not localised in any way. It's one of the reasons I was able to start being a product manager in Sydney, continue being one in San Francisco, and then move back here. And product managers are, are something that both large and small technology companies need. You tend to find that startups start looking for product people when they get to around 30 to 40 people in size. That's uh, a, a rough estimate. It's basically the point at which the CEO no longer has the time to, to fill that function, because they're effectively the first product manager and they're the person who had the original product vision. But when the company has found product market fit and it's beginning to get momentum, they're looking at raising finance, they're working with the boards, they're recruiting an executive leadership team. They start to run out of time to really focus on the details of the product and that's when they bring product people in. You also tend to find that a lot of um, product managers, as Marty mentioned, go on to start their own companies um, or move into executive leadership roles at other companies. 
So I thought I'd give you a few examples uh, of people who've done these kinds of transitions, give an example of how product management can be a stepping stone to other things. I fully admit that most of these art examples are quite Google-centric because they're people I'm familiar with, um, so forgive me for that. But I'll just rattle through a few of them. It's a guy called Brett Taylor. Uh, he was uh, the original product manager for Google Maps, and um, shortly after he did that, he left Google and founded a company called FriendFeed. Uh, they were acquired by Facebook. He became the chief technology officer of Facebook, um, and, and then after doing that for a while, has since founded another company called Quinn who do uh, productive, online productivity software. Uh, you probably recognize Kevin Nystrom, who founded Instagram. So he was, again, previously a product manager at a company called Next Stop. Um, Jess Lee founded Polyvore. She was originally um, a graduate product manager at Google. She was on their APM program, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Steph Hannon. She was a product manager on a number of, of big Google products that you've probably heard of. Um, including Gmail, uh, including Maps, and also Google Wave. Um, and uh, her career is really interesting, actually. She's bounced around a number of places. But last year, um, she became chief technology officer of Hillary Clinton's election campaign um, and was, I think, voted the third most influential woman in technology by Wired Magazine last year. Uh, Marissa, of course. Uh, so Marissa was originally uh, the product manager for Google Search. She was like employee number 20 at Google, I think. Um, she started the APM program that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and then eventually went on to become CEO of Yahoo, of course. And then Sundar. So uh, Sundar was origi the original product manager director for Chrome, the browser, when that launched. Um, and then uh, from Chrome, he went on to also manage Google Apps, so the, uh, the collaboration suite. Uh, and then his remit was expanded to include Chromebooks, and then Android, and then eventually um, he was made CEO of Google. So he did OK. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, worth mentioning also that uh, you know, as a role, if, if this is important to you, you know, this is a, a well compensated role, um, I will fully admit that these numbers are a little bit out of date. They're based on um, some data that uh, I pulled from, from a few years ago, although I haven't adjusted them for inflation. Um, but they, uh, they jive with my kind of general sense of where the market is right now, roughly speaking. These are median values, so you won't necessarily go in at these values, uh, at, these, at these points. You can expect to be a junior product manager for maybe two to three years. The product manager and senior product manager buckets are quite broad, and there's no really clear industry standard at, at which point you flip. Um, but you can imagine that this, this sort of section, product manager to senior product manager, is probably about a seven year stretch, something like that. Um, and then you, know, you go on and up, up, on and up from there. Okay, so just to sort of summarize some of the reasons I think this is you know, a really compelling career. Um, you have a lot of responsibility, right? you're, you're, you're definitely empowered to, to achieve great things, and a lot of autonomy, a lot of trust in the role to do that the way that you think is best. Um, you can actually help people, you can actually solve real problems, you can get stuff done that will actually have an impact on the world. Um, and that, in turn, gives you a sense of doing something very worthwhile, which certainly is important to me on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as I mentioned, you work with a lot of interesting people, you learn a lot of interesting things. Um, a lot of those skills are transferable both to other companies, but also to other roles if you decide to specialize at a later date. Um, you're one of the few people who really understands what's going on uh, in a company. And so often, you know, people who work in companies feel like they don't understand why the business is, is making the decisions it's making. As a product manager, you're at the heart of that. Um, and you have a lot of long-term options, a lot of things you can go on to do from there. Oh, and also, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you both feel valued and you're also well compensated. Okay. However, product management, I'm not going to claim that product management is for everybody. There's certainly um, certain character traits you find in very successful product managers. And so um, I'll rattle through a list in a moment. I recognize that it's quite a long list. Um, I'm not suggesting that to be a product manager you need to to tick every one of these boxes. In fact, you could look at this list as the kind of skills that you might develop if you move into product management. But certainly, when I'm looking, when I'm interviewing people, I'm looking to see you know, whether they, this sort of, this, this, whether their, their character type kind of matches uh, some of the things on this list. So firstly, it's a leadership role. Hopefully this is obvious by now. But when I say leadership role, I don't mean in the sense of telling people what to do. I mean in the sense of telling them uh, or in the sense of pointing the way, showing, showing a sense of direction, a sense of purpose. Um, 
And again, you have to build trust that the product is, is in safe hands with you. Um, communication is critical. It's absolutely essential. You saw you're at the center of that, that um, circle of different um, roles that you work with. And you're essentially a translator. You translate between what the legal team is saying we need to do and what the engineering team need to hear in order to get that done. Um, in fact, I would argue that of everything on this list, the single most important character type of a successful product manager is empathy. Empathy is the one thing that is non-negotiable because you have to be able to empathize with users. You have to understand what they want and what they need. You have to be able to empathize, empathize with the people you're working with who are all operating under their own set of incentives, under their own set of pressures. Um, and you've got to be able to understand that in order to get the best from them. Um, you need a lot of energy. You'll find that engineering teams in particular tend to take their cues as to how things are going from the product manager. So if you start to look down, they will come down with you. If you stay confident, even in the face of setbacks, they will stay confident with you. There's a pragmatic element to this. You have to get stuff done, and that need, means you need a certain degree of organization. Um, and you need to be able to, I mentioned about assessing over quality. Often that means attention to detail. Um, when uh, you've got four different things you're trying to get done for a big event that's not movable, uh, and there's a hundred different teams that are vying for your attention, you have to be able to cope well under that kind of pressure. Um, but obviously there's also, you know, to balance that, there's a creative element in the sense that you have to recognize opportunities for ways to make the product better. You have to recognize opportunities for new product that uh, might really benefit the organization. Um, there's a, a famous quote, which I'm sure I'm going to get completely wrong, from a guy called Jim Barksdale, who was the, the CEO of Netscape. He used to say, if we're making, let me get this right now. Um, if we're making a decision and you've got data, we'll use that. If all we've got is opinions, we'll use mine. Um, and so if you want to get anything done, if you want to actually uh, make smart decisions, they need to be data-driven decisions. Um, so you need to be able to understand what kinds of data you're looking for, how you measure the performance of your product, translate that or, or uh, visualize that in a way that means you can extract insights out of them that, that will help you make informed decisions. Um, it probably goes without saying, but there's a certain element of intellectual curiosity that's essential for the role. Um, I put on there opinionated, which I'm still struggling with a little bit because it's not a great word for what I'm trying to express, but I haven't found a better one. I know opinionated has a sort of a certain negative connotation, and that's not really what I mean. What I mean is you need to be the sort of person who holds and expresses opinions, um, and be willing to do that and comfortable to do that um, without necessarily being arrogant or unpleasant about it. Um, it's not sufficient just to grumble to yourself when you don't think things are being done the right way. You have to be able to be comfortable um, voicing your opinion. And you need to be humble, and what I mean by that is Despite all of this, all of this uh, responsibility, sorry, um, you will often be wrong. Um, uh, you, I, I can't stress how often enough users will surprise you in terms of the way they use their product or their expectations of it. Um, often the decisions you made will turn out to have been the wrong decisions, and it's important that you can just say, you know what, that wasn't the right thing to do. We're going to we're going to change tack. We're going to do something else. Um, and also, that's very important for building trust as well. Uh, is that, is that you respect the opinions of others. Okay. All good so far? Makes sense? Excellent. So, let's assume that you're sold. <laughs> um, and now you're like, okay, well, how do, I, how do I get started as a product manager? So, I'm gonna break this down into two distinct groups, the large companies and the startups. Um, so, this is just a selection of kind of the, the, the bigger technology companies all of which have graduate recruitment and training programs for product managers. Um, Google really set the template for this with their associate product manager program, which was started by Marissa Mayer um, many years ago, uh, back when they were struggling to find people. And she believed that you could take um, smart, motivated graduates and turn them into great product managers. And uh, since then, uh, Google has run this highly structured rotational program where they, um, they recruit students straight out of university uh, they place them in product teams for a year at a time, I think over a two-year period, so you rotate through two teams. Um, there's a whole bunch of training that goes with it. They take you on a world tour where you visit other countries and other, uh, and other cultures to understand the importance of internationalization and cultural sensitivity. Um, it's a very well-respected program. When 
Marissa left Google and went to Yahoo. She took, in a sense, took the program with her. She started an equivalent program there, and it's almost identical in terms of the way it works and how it recruits and so forth. Facebook have a, a similar program called the Rotational Product Management Program, RPM program. Um, they run shorter rotations and more of them because uh, they're a, li a smaller, lighter company, quite fast moving, so they do three six-month rotations. Uh, Microsoft you need to be a little bit careful with because uh, the role um, that we've been describing here today does exist at Microsoft and has existed for many years, probably longer than any of these other companies have even existed, um, but it's known as a program manager there rather than a product manager. Just to keep things confusing, most of these other companies also have a role called a program manager that isn't what we're talking about today. So uh, just be careful, because Microsoft do have a role called a product manager, but it's a marketing function. It's a little different. Um, also worth mentioning, the other kind of the, uh, the two companies obviously missing from here are Apple and, and Amazon. Um, both of those companies hire product managers. I know that for a fact. But I have not uh, found graduate recruitment programs for those that those companies run, which is why they're not on the slide. Um, but once you, you're, um, you're established as a product manager, there are absolutely companies that would be interested in talking to you. Okay, so that's the big company approach. Um, there's also, uh, obviously you might decide, no, I'd rather go into a smaller company. In fact, I've been reading some interesting articles recently that argue that the best place to really earn your chops as a product manager is in a growth stage startup. So that's a company that has got product market fit, is achieving a certain amount of momentum is growing very rapidly um, and consequently everybody who comes in will just have a ton of stuff to do will be exposed to all manner of the business but it's not so big that you're just a little cog in the machine so a company like Uber for example would be a good example of a company at that stage but if you want to look for product management jobs at startups there are a few places you can look um, we have a lot of success in work in startups uh, it's, it's a pretty popular site it always makes me laugh because it looks like it was developed in the late 90s um, but, but it does have a lot of good jobs on there. Uh, AngelList is sort of the, the new hot place to, to, to publish resumes and, and look for jobs in the technology sector. Um, and we tend to find that we have very high, although we don't have as high a volume of candidates from AngelList, we have a very high quality. So that's a good place to look and a good place to create a profile. Um, Mind the Product are an interesting organization. They are a London-based um, organization that are becoming the de facto global product management community. They run conferences uh, and meetups, including a series called Product Tank, um, which happen now in cities all over the world. And uh, they have a website where they publish videos from their events. Uh, and that website includes a jobs board, which is uh, relatively young, but it's, it's gathering momentum. And then, of course, there's LinkedIn. LinkedIn's a tough one because, obviously, everybody is on LinkedIn and every job is on LinkedIn. Uh, and LinkedIn makes it very, very easy to find jobs and apply for them. The consequence of this, I will tell you, as a recruiter, is that you get a very high volume of applications and a very low volume of good quality applications. Um, so if you're gonna, if you find jobs on LinkedIn, or, and this is just general advice, if you find jobs on LinkedIn and you, you want to apply for, you need to work a little bit harder to separate yourself and distinguish yourself from everybody else. So I would advise you to figure out who the hiring managers are, reach out to them, connect you know, with them on LinkedIn, um, make sure you craft a very personal application that talks about why you are interested in this specific role, make it clear that you haven't just um, sort of clicked on every job on LinkedIn. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too long on this slide because I'm sure this is pretty obvious. I'm sure you, you've heard this from many sources before, but um, I reviewed about 200 applications for PM jobs last year and some very clear uh, themes stood out in terms of the quality of applications I was receiving. Um, the first thing is, particularly if, you're, if you don't have any prior experience, Clearly, you need to differentiate yourself again. So any examples you can demonstrate, either in your CV or your cover letter, of, of cases where you've taken initiative or shown leadership will grab my attention. And that could be anything from stuff you've done for charity, or stuff you did on the year abroad, or it could be um, that you participate in hackathons, or that you've been involved in building an app, or such like. Yes? Um, is there a risk that you've done a lot of things and that might actually scare people that uh, you're actually too busy, maybe, because <laughs> that's sort of happened in the past, and that was taken negatively back. I think uh, that feels to me. I mean, I'd have to look at the, ex the specific example, but that feels to me like more of a communication challenge. Okay. Like the question then is, how do you cherry pick the things that are most relevant um, and and really highlight those? 
Because really, the goal of your application is purely to get you to the next stage, right? It's not going to make or break your application. It's just make sure you don't end up in the bin. Um, um, you would be horrified, like absolutely horrified, at how bad the written English is in the majority of cover letters that I received. Um, and given that the product management role involves a lot of communication, a lot of reviewing documentation, of, of emailing partners, of crafting slide decks for events, I can't risk having to the need to copy check everything you do. So if you have any kind of, uh, you know, if there's any kind of grammar or spelling issues on your application, you just won't get through the first filter. Um, do not write an essay, please. <laughs> um, it just, what I need really to see is, is two things. Why are you interested in this role? And why are you right for this role? So your CV obviously will tell me about your history, but the cover letter should tell me what it is about this role and you that is such a good match. Oh, and I mentioned don't just repeat your CV. I got a lot of cover letters that basically said, I would like to apply for this role because I studied here and then I did this and then I did this and it's just a copy of everything that's in their CV. And that's not really the goal again of the cover letter. Okay, uh, just a quick thing. Um, obviously be aware that you know I will, I will not necessarily stalk you on Facebook, but I will at least check if you've got a Twitter feed, if you've got um, a website. I'll be looking for evidence you know, that of good things, mostly like have you published articles, have you participated in events where you know, perhaps you've spoken somewhere and there's a video of it. Uh, I did have a few weird cases where I checked someone's LinkedIn profile and it didn't match their CV, which is kind of a schoolboy error, don't, don't do that. Like some people were trying to, uh, let's say, um, cast previous roles as being more product managing than they actually were but they haven't actually bothered to reflect that on LinkedIn. So uh, if you're going to fake it, at least make an effort. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the product management interview process looks like, what you can expect. Um, these are the sort of five main topics that you're likely to be, uh, to be discussing in a series of product management interviews. To give you some context, if you go for an interview at a place like Google, you will likely have about four interviews, which is a lot less than it used to be, you'll be happy to hear. Um, and they will cover these topics. You'll tend to find one that's specifically about product, uh, product instincts, and we'll go through these in a second. One that's analytical, um, one that's technical, and then one that covers everything else. Okay, uh, some general uh, interview tips. Again, I don't want to patronize you. I'm sure you've heard some of these before, but um, something always worth, I always like to stress is that I know finding jobs is hard and stressful. I can tell you, finding people to fill jobs is also hard and stressful. And the positive benefit of this is that if you're in an interview with someone, assuming that it's a good company, they want you to do well, right? Because if you don't do well, that's an hour of their life they will never get back. Um, so they're on your side, they want you to do well. Um, so don't panic. Um, and also, you know, take a breath, don't be afraid to leave some dead air, don't be afraid to ask for time if you want to think about something. Um, engage with the interviewer. Try and read them, read their reactions. Are you talking too much? Do they want more details? Have a conversation with them. They're not just interviewing you to figure out what you know, they're interviewing you to figure out whether there's something, someone they want to spend 40 hours a week with, which is a pretty high bar, right? So you actually want to um, have a good conversation with them, enjoy yourself, um, take any opportunities they give you to demonstrate your strengths. Um, you know, I've, I've seen a number of candidates who I'd ask a question and they would just give me one answer and stop. Like, you know, if they throw you a bone, run with it and make the most of it. Um, and then demonstrate you know, how you go about thinking things, so think out loud. All right, let's talk about the different, the different types and, and talk about a few examples here. So product instincts, product interviews are about your ability to recognize a good product and what makes a good product and understand users and what they need. So um, what you'll tend to find is they will ask you um, to uh, discuss how you would go about designing a particular product or solving a particular use case using a, with a product. Um, and the key thing to do here is to start with who the user is, right? Take a user-centric approach. So I used to sometimes ask people to, um, well, let me give you an example. Let's say I said to you, how would you go about designing an app to help me discover gluten-free bakeries in my neighborhood? It's like a proper San Francisco hipster question. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I would, you know, what you would see is that some candidates 
they would just get up and they would go straight to the whiteboard and they'd draw a screen on a phone and then they'd draw a map and then they'd draw a list of, of, of businesses. And they would basically just re-implement Google Maps but with a bakery filter applied to it. Um, the good candidates are the ones that step back and say, why is this app needed? And what, are you, what are you trying to achieve? What are your requirements? Why are you not being well served by existing solutions? So establish who your audience is. If necessary, if you find that there are multiple audiences, then and say, okay, um, this app, you, you've asked me about a travel app, uh, but um, that you could be catering to someone who is on a gap year and on a budget, or you could be catering to someone who you know, likes luxury yacht holidays. Um, so I'm gonna choose this audience for the purposes of answering this question. Um, obviously, I mentioned empathy. Um, understand any, uh, any constraints, so ask clarifying questions around um, around the requirements. Although um, interviewers are not necessarily trying to trip you up, they will often leave out some details to make sure that you think to flesh out those requirements, to, to explore the problem space. And then at the end, come up with the simplest solution you can. I am not impressed with your overly elaborate, complicated, clever solution. I just want the simplest possible solution because that's the solution that realistically can actually be built. Okay, so design questions, there's a, a, a couple of different ways to do this, but one of the most common is to give you an example of a screen or a page on a website or some product and say, how would you improve this? Um, or how would you change it? And uh, the key thing here really is to, just un is to get to the bottom of what the goals are of that, uh, of that part of the product. What I mean by that is, what user um, behaviors is it trying to facilitate and to what end? In other words, what does the business want users to be doing here? Um, it's also good to understand what are the constraints uh, that influence the current design. So for example, if you looked at the website for Crowdcube, you'd find a page where you can, li you can list all of the companies that are currently raising finance that you can invest in right now. And if you did that, you would look at that page and think, why is each of those companies taking up so much space on the screen? Like as a search result, like massive. Um, and as a consequence, to get through the list, you've got to scroll and scroll and scroll. You know, and this is, this is very strange. Why is that? Well, it's because when that page was designed, the company was much younger, and there was only a handful of companies raising at any one time. And so we need to make the site look busy, right? We need to make it look, look full. You could just have a short list of five and a huge gap underneath it. But these days, the, the business has moved on. We have far more companies, and essentially, it's no longer fit for purpose. We need to redesign it to, to both to suit the business now, but also to suit the business for the next five years. And lastly, and I always like to stress this, is you tend to find that the vast majority of students, uh, or, or interview candidates in general in fact, when faced with these kinds of questions, assume that everything on that page is sacred. That everything that's in the product right now has to be retained. And that all they can really do is rearrange things and polish things and just make it look a bit nicer. But of course, that's not the reality of the world. The reality is that, you know, that only 10% of the features of your product get high volumes of use. And that most products could be improved just by removing stuff that doesn't get a lot of use, by simplification. The candidates that impress me are the ones who are actually willing to say, actually, I'm not sure you need that. Now, why don't you take that out? That's very rare, but it's always very refreshing. Analytical skills. So analytical skills are about understanding your ability to take a problem and break it down. It's also about estimation. So for example, um, you'll, you'll find in technology companies you have to estimate how much traffic your site might get at a particular in response to a particular event or for a particular product launch. How much capacity do you need in the, in the infrastructure? Um, and what you tend to get is, is these things called Fermi estimation questions, which is where you're asked to estimate some random number um, with very little supporting information. And so it's just an example, like estimate how many send the screens in the UK. Often there are multiple ways of doing this. You know, there might be one way you focus on the supply or one way you focus on the demand. Um, they're all fine as long as you're just very, very transparent as to what your model is. So what you need to do is you need to say, okay, this is how I'm going to go about, um, how I'm going to go about estimating this. I'm going to break it down the following way and kind of write a pseudo equation on the board. Um, so in this example, you might say, well, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and estimate how many people um, frequent the cinema 
um, and, the, and how big a cinema you need to accommodate that number of people. Um, and, uh, and so you put these, these unknowns up on the board and then you explain how they relate to each other and then how you're going to estimate each of them. Uh, and normally, actually, with a bit of thought, you can come up with a, a, a pretty reasonable answer, bearing in mind that in most cases you only need to be sort of order of magnitude. Um, the one thing I put at the end there, sanity check your result. What I mean by that is sometimes you see candidates who they come up with a model and it's a good model and they put it on the board, they start working through it, they make some mistakes in terms of their, their estimates, like the numbers they, put, that they substitute into these variables, if you like. Uh, they don't recognize that. They get to the end and they come up with a result that's clearly wrong by any rational uh, like analysis. But because they're so vested in the model, they don't recognize it. So just step back and look. The, a good example of this was someone who I was mentoring. And I asked them a question which uh, uh, is very heavily discussed online, so will never be asked in a real interview, um, which was um, estimate how many planes there are in the air over the US right now. Uh, and there's a couple of different ways of doing that. The way that they decided to go about it was by estimating how many people were flying uh, on any given day, um, and which is a perfectly fine approach. And then you estimate the average capacity of a plane, and you're basically, you're basically there. However, when he got to the point where he had an estimate of how many people were people were flying, not planes, but people were flying, um, his number was 100 million. Um, and I said to him, "So let's stop there for a second. What's the population of the U.S.?" He said, "300 million." I said, "Do you think one in three people are in the air right now?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, so clearly, it was you know, obviously not the case. Um, but it is very easy to kind of just get swept up in it. OK, technical skills. So at large companies, you'll actually have an engineer come and interview you. And the goal of that interview is not to test your ability, or should not be to test your ability, to write algorithms or, or pseudocode. It's to test your ability to hold high bandwidth conversations with engineers, which is like a central part of the role. Like You need to be able to explain to them what you need, and they need to be able to explain to you what constraints they're operating under. And they do not need to be spending their time explaining to you what a relational database is. So they want to make sure that you understand the fundamental concepts um, and, the sen and, and the sort of sensitivities um, so that you can have these very um, effective conversations. Um, I would say understand the business of the company before you go into this interview and, and try and find out if you can what technology they rely on because it's likely where they'll focus. If you come into your crowdcube right now, it's fair to say we're primarily a web-centric company. We don't currently have a mobile app. So the majority of the technical questions you can expect to hear from me or, or, or people on my team relate to web technology. OK. Strategy. So strategy is about remembering that products are not just about serving users. They're also about serving the business. So can you formulate? a successful strategy around a product, one that will support the product, generate value for the business, um, and uh, you know, fund its continued development, effectively. So my recommendation in these, with these types of questions is always to start with recognizing where the value lies. And what I mean by that is, is where does the customer base recognize the value to exist in the service you're offering? And that may not be where the complexity exists. It may not be where the cost exists. Um, so Again, a concrete example, uh, if you look at, uh, if you're using Google Maps uh, and you request driving directions from here to Edinburgh, the raw data that those directions are based on is actually in the public domain. Like OpenStreetMap and other organizations like that allow you to download those map vectors. And so you could hypothetically figure out that route for yourself. But the value there lies in the algorithms that Google have developed to do that quickly and efficiently and accurately. It's not in the, the underlying data. If you look at Street View, on the other hand, all the value of Street View is in the data. Right? The actual user experience of Street View is not very complicated. It's just pan around some images. The value is all in the actual images. If you had a copy of the complete Street View corpus, then you basically have all the value there is. So once you've figured out where the value is, um, it's, it's the value, that value is what people will likely pay for. Um, and then you can start enumerating different ways of, of building a business around that value. Um, be transparent about the pros and cons of different ways of doing it. Um, so, for example, sometimes I ask people to talk about 
possible alternative monetization models for Wikipedia. Um, so obviously advertising is a one easy one, but it has some pretty significant trade-offs when it comes to kind of editorial independence. Um, don't just focus on one option. Like think of as many different options as you can, and then let the interviewer decide if they want to follow up on anything in particular. And be aware of the overall goals of the organization. So um, if you're interviewing at Facebook, and you suggested a strategy for a part of their business that was actually in conflict with their goal as a company to connect the world, um, that's not going to go down very well. OK. Um, so if you are going into a set of product management interviews, I would recommend some practice beforehand. And this is a great site for doing that. It was written by someone who had some interviews lined up and couldn't find uh, an easy way to practice. It's basically a site that just fires questions at you with a timer until you run out of life. Um, uh, but it's, it's, really, it's really nicely done. Um, one little thing I just want to mention, uh, not really product management specific, but it's just something I, I, I care quite passionately about, is it's important to recognize that when you are in an interview, you're interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you, because you are going to be spending a significant portion of your life in that environment. And so uh, do not be fooled by the free food. Do not be fooled by the, the chair massage. Do not be fooled by the foosball table. There are only three things that will actually make a difference between whether you enjoy working at that company or whether you hate it. And that is, are you working with good people? Do you enjoy the work you're doing? And are you working in a supportive environment and a supportive culture? Those are the three things that you need to figure out when you're interviewing with someone. Do you like this person? Does it sound like the work they're going to be expecting you to do is something you're going to enjoy doing? And do you feel like this is an environment in which you'll be happy to spend that amount of time every day? Okay, so um, this is the website that goes with this presentation. Uh, so I've been delivering this presentation for, this is like the fourth time, something like that. Um, and so I put this website together to go with it, which is basically somewhere for you to go uh, for, for additional, like more information, for supporting materials if you want to continue uh, researching. Um, also, these presentations get posted on this website if you need to uh, refer to them in future. And those, um, those little interviews you saw, there's a library of those. Uh, each of them are about five or six minutes long, but, but I'm building up on that site as well. Um, so feel, feel free to check that out. Yeah, so presentations and uh, these PM stories. I think, yes, that 